As always, we've recruited an all-star lineup, beginning with the leadoff man, Michael Nyberg, the Henry L. Stimson Chair of the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. A graduate of the University of Michigan and Carnegie Mellon in his hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Nyberg has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a founding member of the International Society for the Study of the Great War, and a trustee of the Society for Military History. His, his many books include Dance of the Furies, Europe and the Outbreak of World War I, published in 2011 by Harvard, which the Wall Street Journal named one of the five best books on the Great War. A little competition there for Neil Ferguson. Also, The Blood of Free Men, A History of the 1944 Liberation of Paris, published by Basic Books in 2012. He has a book on Potsdam, The End of World War II, forthcoming. And his current project is a history of American responses to the European War from 1914 to 1917. Please welcome Professor Nyberg. Well, good morning, everybody. And let me start with the same thanks to all of my friends at FPRI and here at Cantini. I don't know, Paul, this is my six, seven time coming out here. It's always a great, great pleasure. And thank you to FPRI and thank you to Cantini for everything that you guys do. There is no better place to look at the First World War than right here, even if Paul told me that this painting of the American uh, senior leaders from World War I is going back to some giant empty warehouse guarded by Indiana Jones somewhere in DC in a little while. Uh, I just came from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point uh, earlier this week, uh, where these words appear in the library, uh, words from the founder of West Point, or the man who came up with the idea to have West Point, Thomas Jefferson. And every time I go into the new library at West Point, I'm struck by these words. Uh, there's a similar one on the other side as you walk into the main library. Uh, they are words that seem to indicate to me what a watershed the First World War really is in American history. This is not the way we think of military power in the United States these days. And I was struck as I was putting this talk together that your students, like my own two daughters in 10th and 7th grade, have never known their nation at peace, something that I'm struck by a lot. The people of 1914, of course, never really knew their country at war, with the maybe brief exception of 1898. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as we go forward. The First World War is a great watershed in the history of this country. And in this 100th anniversary period, I would argue, regardless of the year associated with the anniversary, we need to wrestle with it and we need to think about it quite carefully. And that's what I want to do with you here today, at least for, for my hour here. You're going to hear from some fantastic speakers today, many of them I'm privileged to call good friends. It's going to be a great learning experience, and I'm very sorry that I have to leave uh, almost as soon as I'm done here. Uh, this is my email address, however. You can also get it from FPRI if there's any question that comes to you in the next couple of days or hereafter that you want to uh, interact with me or ask me. I'd be more than happy to answer. And again, my apologies for having to go a little early. It's been a busy week. Um, I'm not sure how you learned the First World War's origins for the United States. I'm not sure how you teach it. But when I learned it as a high school student, I think I can say with confidence, I learned nothing of importance, interest, or value. <laughs> I learned that there was an American president who had these ideas. I learned that a ship was sunk in 1915. And then I learned that the United States was at war. Not particularly helpful. What I'd like to do today is take you on a journey from 1914 to 1917 to give you an idea of kind of what I'm going to say in the book that's uh, due to come out this fall to explain how the American people were understanding the events of 1914 to 1917 in Europe and why it matters that they looked at them the way that they did. And I'm going to use a guy from North Carolina as an example here. I'm going to use the American ambassador to Great Britain, Walter Hines Page, to kind of show you this journey that I want to take you on. Uh, Walter Hines Page was a journalist. His brother was a senator. They were both big backers of Woodrow Wilson. And as a result, Wilson made him the ambassador to Great Britain. In August 1914, when the war broke out, Page wrote this letter to Woodrow Wilson. Now and ever, he said, I thank heaven for the Atlantic Ocean. Thank God we are out of it. And this was a fairly typical response of the American people in 1914. Something bad was happening somewhere in the world, but it wasn't ours to worry about. The Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean provided sufficient safety for the United States. This wasn't our fight. Look what Page is saying in October 1915 to the president. If Germany wins, he says, 
The Monroe Doctrine will be shot through. We shall have to have a great army and navy. And please remember that for someone in America in 1915, that was a bad thing, not a good thing. And Page later says, this means investing money in battleships rather than universities. What Page saw is bad. But suppose that England wins. We shall then have merely an academic dispute with her. It is a matter of life or death for English-speaking civilization. And I want to make two points here before I go on. The first is that Walter Hines Page was well ahead of most Americans in making this statement by October 19, in October 1915. He's way ahead. In the summer of 1916, he came to the United States hoping to talk to Wilson, hoping to explain to him why he had come to this conclusion. Wilson did everything he could to avoid Page. Page went so far as to go down to the president's summer home in New Jersey and sit on the front porch, hoping that the president would show up. The other point that I want to make is that I think that by April of 1917, the vast majority of the American people had come to agree with Walter Hines Page. So what I want to do is take you on that journey from now, you know, thank God we are out of it, to a matter of life and death, and explain to you what that means. And the way I'd like to start is by looking at the way Americans looked at Germany in the years before uh, the First World War. There had been a number of scandals in Germany, uh, one very famous one called the Severn Affair that I can explain a little more in the Q&A if you would like, that made front page news in the United States. These were civil military relations kinds of scandals. And the American people drew, this is a popular image in Europe as it is in the United States, it's even popular inside Germany, what came to be called the Two Germanies thesis, and I know you all know this, but a little bit of history is worth uh, uh, retelling here. Between 1864 and 1871, the unification of Germany happened under the dominance of Prussia. And the Two Germanies thesis essentially argues, it's much more complicated than this, but it essentially argues that there's a humane, good Germany that produced Beethoven and Gotha and Kant and all the great things we admire about Germany, education and science and medicine and all of those things, and then there is a bad aristocratic Prussian Germany that is swallowing up the good Germany. So you get comments like this one. Oswald Villard, himself born in Wiesbaden, writing in September 1914, America has much in common with the great German nation, but little in common with the militarist caste and the imperial attitude of the German regime. And if we have anybody here from Nebraska, Willa, Willa Cather's um, 1921 book, One of Ours, which won the Pulitzer Prize, captures this as well, where they keep talking about the good Germans here in the United States and the bad Germans over there in Europe. Mary Roberts Reinhardt, a person that to me is uh, absolutely fascinating. She was a mystery writer. She was called the American Agatha Christie later in her life. Got an offer from the Saturday Evening Post to go to Europe and be the first woman ever allowed into the trenches. She's at a cocktail party in Pittsburgh when this happens. Her husband stands up and says, you will not go, I forbid it. Mary Roberts Reinhardt stood up and said, I'm not going to let the greatest event of my life go past me without seeing it. And she went. After her husband insisted on the Saturday Evening Post putting on a life insurance policy on her. <laughs> and after seeing the Western Front, after seeing Belgium, after seeing Europe, this is what she wrote. The Germans are not butchers or fiends, but victims of a system against which someday they would rise and rebel. And the theory went like this. Actually, two, two theories one of which comes out beautifully in President Wilson's declaration of war speech in April of 1917. The first is that the United States is not making war on people. We are making war on a regime. And if that sounds familiar, it should. Right? We are making war against the government. And the second, and it comes even from people like Villard, who was a German but not a Prussian, that destroying the Prussian regime would actually be good for Germany. That this war is the fault of regimes, undemocratic ones. It is not the fault of, of the German people. And I think this is important, especially to understand the ways in which Woodrow Wilson is reflecting a common consensus, rather than kind of leading an American mindset. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, there were Germans who defended Germany's position. This is the, probably the most prominent, probably the most important of them, a professor at Harvard University named Ugo Munsterberg. Um, and I'm amazed the more I dug into his life, the ways in which he touched so much of what happened in this period, um, even down to the point where the, the man who uh, did the Wonder Woman cartoons was a student of Munsterberg's at Harvard and used Munsterberg's theories about culture to design Wonder Woman. Really fascinating. Anyway, Munsterberg had been teaching at Harvard for a long time. He never sought American citizenship. He called himself a German living in America rather than a German-American. 
And for a while, he became Germany's most eloquent defender. He argued, not without reason, that the First World War had begun because, as he wrote here, of the uncultured hordes of the East, this is code for the Russians, who begrudged the prosperity of the fatherland. It is a sin against the spirit of history to denounce Germany as the aggressor. And Munsterberg started writing letters, op-eds. He wrote an open letter to President Wilson, threatening Wilson with losing the German-American vote to the Democratic Party. That backfired on him rather badly. And Munsterberg again became the kind of vision. So there were people defending Germany. But I think it's interesting to look at the track of what happened to these people. Uh, Munsterberg uh, almost got fired from Harvard. Harvard got an offer from a major donor if they would fire him. To their credit, Harvard said no. But the president of Harvard University wrote Munsterberg letters saying you should come back to the community of Harvard, even though it's clear that nobody in Cambridge, Boston, or Harvard agrees with you. And you should keep the war out of your lectures. You should stop doing that. Uh, Munsterberg, after the sinking of the Lusitania, more or less stopped speaking and writing about the war. I, I don't know whether that's because he disagreed with German policy after the Lusitania. The Lusitania is a very important watershed moment here. It doesn't lead America into war, if your textbooks uh, say that. But it is a really important turning point, which I can also talk about in the Q&A. Uh, or whether he just decided to remain silent. And shortly after this, in the middle of delivering a lecture at Radcliffe College, he had an aneurysm and died. So it's hard to get a sense of kind of where his thinking was going past 1915. What's more interesting to me, if I could have the next slide, please, was the response of the American people to Hugo Munsterberg. This is a former student of his, uh, a Boston lawyer. And you can see his reaction, not one American has appeared to be unfriendly to the German people as a whole, again, picking up on this uh, to Germany's thesis. But everyone has expressed the fervent hope that the present German government will get the full measure of drubbing that it deserves for years of arrogance, culminating in the present dubious frame-up. And the end of that is a reference that most Americans made, that no army could have been ready to do what the German army did if this thing hadn't been planned for years. No army could have moved into Belgium, into France, mobilized that quickly, if this hadn't been planned for a very long time. And there were a couple of books that were popular in the United States certainly after the war began in English translations, one of them by Friedrich Bernhardi, Germany in the Next War, a very popular book inside Germany as well, um, that Americans used to prove the case that Germany had wanted this war all along. And Gilbert Seldy is a very popular uh, New York critic and theater writer and just kind of general commentator about man about town kind of guy. When talking about Ugo Munsterberg said that, uh, that Munsterberg's pleas failed because before the attorney came to court, his client's hands were stained with blood. I like that one a lot. And then you can see this image from the African-American newspaper, the Chicago Defender, in which the character of war itself is wearing a German spy helmet. So to my analysis, from the very beginning of this war, Americans thought Germany was the aggressor. That was not the same thing as saying that the United States should join the war, and it was not the same thing as saying that Britain and France's interests were the same as America's. And I'm going to prove that case to you. If I could have the next slide, please. I would like you to note the date on this. I apologize for the poor quality of this map, but the library where I found it uh, was not real happy with me flattening an old volume and scanning it. So this is an iPhone picture. My apologies. That's why I can't use it in the book. I can't get a high enough resolution. That, believe it or not, my press doesn't like that. Um, I'd like you to note two things about this map. The first is the date. Actually, I'd like you to know three things. The first is the date. November 26, 1914. This is months before the Lusitania. This is a month before the first Christmas of the war. The image is titled, A Map of Europe for Permanent Peace. What do you notice about the map? There is no Germany. There is no Germany. This is November of 1914. You can also note how much Belgium will grow as a result, right? in compensation for what Germany has done to Belgium. The outpouring of support for France in the United States was enormous in the beginning of World War I, a fellow democracy, one that has no interest in conflict with those of the United States, unlike Great Britain, where we did have interests that didn't overlap. The other thing I'd like you to notice are the images on the left-hand side. The one on the top is the Belgian city of Louvain, which the Germans burned. Louvain is important to Americans because for a time, the British recaptured or liberated Louvain for a short time, and Americans could see Louvain with their own eyes. And it was interesting to me to go back and look at the reports of people like Mary Roberts Reinhardt, some of the other American journalists who were in Europe, and they all say, to a person, they all say, don't believe the British media. 
Believe the atrocities we can prove. Believe the things we've seen with our own eyes. So I'm very suspicious of this propaganda British media argument uh, that you sometimes see. Louvain is important because American reporters saw it themselves and saw what had happened there with their own eyes. One American reporter was actually locked in a locomotive boxcar for a little while, and he was watching it through the slats in the boxcar. So Americans saw the burning of Louvain. The image on the bottom is the great cathedral at Reims in, in eastern France, which the Germans bombarded and shelled and then claimed they had to do this because the French were using it as an artillery observation tower, and therefore it was a legitimate military target. And Americans were in Reims as well and said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's an outright fabrication. And again, all of this is leading to this initial American sympathy for, the, uh, for uh, uh, Britain and France. Again, more because of the bad things Germany was doing than for the good things Britain and France were doing, although there's some of that as well. A second theme that I want to talk about here uh, is the financial aspects of the First World War. When the First World War broke out, the American economy was in recession, and that's important. That's obviously very important. When the war broke out, the British, French, and Germans attempted to sell the securities they had in the United States, convert them into gold, and take that gold back to Europe. In one day, in August 1914, more gold had been withdrawn from American banks than had been withdrawn in any month in the previous history of the United States. And with the American currency backed by gold, that's an unbelievably dangerous situation. In early August 1914, the New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago stock markets shut down and did not reopen until mid-November. Four months with no stock markets trading. Think about the impact that would have on the economy of the United States. It virtually destroyed it. Most American shipping, most American credit, most American insurance for overseas transactions happened on British ships and British firms. All of that stopped. The United States economy took an enormous nosedive. The first thing Americans are worried about when the war begins is how to get out of that economic disaster. Right? And I can talk about some of the things that, that the Wilson administration did. One of the ones I, I, I think is most interesting, they ordered gold sent to private banks in the United States. Imagine doing this today with our security concerns. And they put in the newspapers, $100 million worth of gold is going to come right down State Street in Chicago to these banks. And it's going to arrive at 2.30, 3.30, 4.30 p.m., right? What they were trying to do is make people feel secure, make them believe that the banks were going to be okay. And sure enough, here comes millions of dollars worth of gold right down the main streets of the United States. Imagine doing that. Now, what happened was, sooner, eventually, by, by the middle of November, some of you may know a little bit of the history of this, the government had taken active steps, which were controversial steps, including introducing an income tax, because with overseas trade coming apart, that meant there was no customs revenue coming in, and by creating the Federal Reserve Bank, a controversial progressive move early in the years before the war, that is now absolutely necessary if the stock markets are going to reopen. Both of those things happen. By November 1914, the American stock market is functioning again, the American banking system is functioning again, and Great Britain and France desperately need American goods. What's interesting to me, by the end of 1914, leaders of American finance, insurance, agriculture, industry, you name the industry, American Bible salesmen are in this group, are beginning to realize that the First World War can make this country an unbelievable amount of money. American pencil manufacturers create a corporation because most American pencils had come from Germany. And the argument is twofold. One, we can make a lot of money by selling whatever the Europeans want to them, and the Europeans are going to need everything. And the second thing is, things like pencils and Bibles, which Americans used to buy from Europe, they're now going to have to buy from other American firms. Can I have the next slide, please? I found this image right here in Chicago at the Newberry Library last summer. This is from the Chicago Tribune. Again, I'd like you to note the date. This is April 1915, a month before the Lusitania. On the left is Uncle Sam. The docks of New York City are literally magnets, pulling the hard currency of Europe from their side of the Atlantic Ocean over two hours. 
and the flag on the ship says the money center of the world, while the British, French, and Germans look on completely exasperated. And American industrialists, bankers, farmers all knew it. They all knew it. This is a chance to reorient the world's economy from London and Paris to Washington and New York for as far into the future as you dare to dream. American universities took the same approach. Whereas we used to send our best to Europe, now Europe's going to send their best to us. University of Michigan, as, as Walter mentioned, my alma mater, uh, their medical school began an active program in the fall of 1914 to get those American students who would normally have gone to German universities and get them to go to Ann Arbor instead. This is happening very, very early on. We have an opportunity to reorient all of this back to us. The other important trend about this, of course, as the Allies want to buy things from the United States, it is much easier, of course, for Great Britain to do this than any other country. Even before the war, about 75% of American shipments overseas happened in British ships with British credit and British insurance. The other wonderful advantage the British have is that the United States has an undefended 3,000-mile border with Great Britain. Remember, in 1914, Canada is part of the British Empire. If you own the Paul Herbert Pencil Company in Chicago, Illinois, the only risk you really have to run is getting that stuff across the Canadian border. Whereas, if you want to trade with Germany, you have to find the credit, the insurance, the shipping, and take the risk of what the Royal Navy might do with it. The point is that America's sympathies and its economic motivation line up almost perfectly. They line up almost perfectly, with a couple of exceptions that I'd be happy to talk about if you'd like. What that means is that America's material contributions and its moral contributions are going in the same direction. And as I know many of you know, thousands and thousands of American nurses, doctors, volunteer soldiers, volunteer pilots are going to serve in the British and French armies. Jonathan Vance in the University of Western Ontario estimates there might be as many as 80,000 Americans who volunteered for the British Army in Canada. 80,000. That's a very big number. I found some documents that said that a lot of these guys were running away from unwanted pregnancies, unemployment, criminal records, fights with their fathers, all sorts of stuff. But still, 80,000 is 80,000. And as some of you know, there are some very high-profile people that are doing this. Alan Seeger, the wealthy men of the Lafayette Escadrille who fly for the French in World War I. Right, these are creating more and more links back and forth. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do here, the other thing, thing that I want to do, the, the, another theme that I want to approach, um, there has been a presumption, though I'm not sure it's ever been adequately backed up, that immigrant groups in the United States responded the way they did to the war because of pressure coming from the top. What I'd like to suggest here, and what, I'm going to, what I argue for sure in the book, is that most of what is happening, at least before the United States entry into the war, after U.S. entry, is a little bit different. It's things that are going on inside American immigrant communities that are more important. It's the internal dynamic that's more important. And what I want to do very briefly is talk about a couple of these things. And then, like I said, I'd be happy to talk more uh, in the Q&A if you would like. And I want to talk about really two. There's a third that's on here, but... Um, I might not talk too much about that in the interest of time. The first is that right about the same time as the Lusitania is sunk by the Germans, Italy enters World War I. What that means is that Italian Americans have the closest connections to the war of any group in the United States. So, for example, um, immigrant aid societies in, that were functioning, Italian American immig uh, uh, immigrant aid societies, they were in Philadelphia, they were in New York, I'm sure they were here in Chicago as well. In the years before World War I, their mission was to help Italian immigrants adjust to their new life in the United States. After 1915, they stopped doing that because there are no immigrants coming over. Instead, what they do, they use those same resources to help Italian reservists in the Italian army get back to Italy so they can fight for Italy. Right? There's a tight connection uh, between those two things. Could I have the next slide, please? The other thing that, I wanted to, that, that is important here is the level of assimilation and acculturation that's going on inside these communities. 
inside the Italian American community, the Irish American community, and the Jewish uh, American uh, community, which are three of the groups that I look at here in the book. People like Fiorello LaGuardia, whose airport I'm glad I didn't have to fly out of last night. LaGuardia is the only airport I've ever been in where I heard, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're number 36 for departure. So I was careful not to fly out of LaGuardia. Uh, David Walsh, the first Catholic Irish American governor in Massachusetts. Idaho, Idaho had a Jewish governor in 1914, 1915, right? Louis Brandeis joining the Supreme Court. All of these things are evidence of this kind of general assimilation acculturation process that's going on. And immigrant communities, of course, knew it. They knew, A, that they had more at stake. They had more uh, 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 buy-in into the American system. And they also knew, Munsterberg complained about this a lot when it came to German Americans, that those people born in the United States did not see the world the way those born in Europe did. To Munsterberg, this was a bad thing. It meant that German Americans focused on the American, not on the German. Right? They didn't care about what was going on in Germany. Right? Something similar is going on here. Um, it's happening with the Jewish American community as well. Next slide, please. Another thing that I wanted to focus on is something that not too many folks uh, have done a lot of research on, but I find it completely fascinating. Uh, Doug Mastriano, who just, I think, walked out, and I uh, work at the Army War College. There is a street there called Garrison Lane, I always just assumed that Garrison Lane was named for the Garrison. It's not. In 1915, 1916, the American Secretary of War was a man by the name of William, Win, William Lindley Garrison from the great state of New Jersey. And Garrison looked around at the way the American army was situated and said, look, if we do get into a shooting war, the army is not prepared. The army can't do this. So in late 1915 and early 1916, he presented something he called the Continental Army Plan. And as I know many of you know, the American Army is built on a weird, difficult, uh, decentralized model. We have the regular army, we have the reserves, and then we have the state national guards. Garrison, like a good progressive, said it doesn't make any sense to have a military system that effectively has 49 commanders in chief. That's ridiculous. And the expedition to go find Pancho Villa proved the case. As two state governors refused to let their troops leave the state, one, Kentucky demobilized the National Guard rather than see it go out of Kentucky. Garrison said, that's crazy. So what he did is he came up with something he called the Continental Army Plan, which would replace that National Guard system with a centralized army and a reserve, both controlled directly from Washington. A modern military the way that the Europeans have one. And as you might guess, he ran into great opposition inside the American political system. You can guess who he probably ran into opposition from. He ran into opposition first and foremost from the state governors because it meant that they would no longer control their own National Guards. He also met intense resistance from the southern contingents of the U.S. House and U.S. Senate. And the House Armed Services Committee was run then by a Virginian, James Hay, who objected because, even though Woodrow Wilson was, had no plans to integrate the American Army, the Continental Army Plan would make it easier to do so in the future. So in 1916, which is a presidential election year, this issue of how to build the United States Army is coming up. Garrison's trying to get Wilson to back the Continental Army Plan. He won't do it. He tries to get Wilson to at least talk to the American people about reforms that have to happen if the American Army is going to be ready to go. And then in February 1916, Garrison creates a minor national scandal when he and his assistant secretary of war both resign. And Garrison writes a very sharp, nasty letter to Woodrow Wilson. This is the second cabinet member to resign, the first being the Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, who resigned after the Lusitania incident for another reason. The point that I want to make is that the United States, all foreign policy, of course, is also domestic policy. And in this presidential election year especially, much of what the United States did in its defense orientation was done for political reasons. Right? In other words, the First World War is not so different from every other war that came after it. What we got instead was something called the National Defense Act of 1916, which produced a lot of things, one of which it created ROTC, for those of you that have a background in that program. The other thing that it did is that it kept the National Guard in place. The National Guard agreed to abide by federal standards of training, and the federal government agreed to pay for all of that training. This is what drove Garrison crazy. He's got a limited amount of money that he can spend on defense. That amount of money's not going up and now it's going to be doled out to 48 state governors. I mean, the point is that political decisions made in the 1916 campaign made the United States Army that these guys led 
less effective and less prepared for what they had to do. Next slide, please. And as I said, as you all know, 1916 was a presidential election year. And although we talk about this as, uh, you know, Wilson's uh, slogans, war in Europe, peace in America, he kept us out of war, the reality is the two candidates did everything they possibly could not to talk about the war in Europe for two reasons, the most important of which is they agreed on fundamental policy. They both wanted to keep the United States neutral until such time as that was no longer possible. And the other reason was they both, both Wilson and his Republican rival Charles Evans Hughes, made a calculation that anything they said on the campaign trail about the war was bound to offend somebody. If they argued for neutrality, it would upset those Americans who wanted the United States to take a firmer role. If they talked about intervention, it would upset those Americans who talked about neutrality. And I found in the New York Times two letters to the editor written in support of Charles Evans Hughes in two consecutive days. One of the letters says, I'm voting for Hughes because if he's elected, he'll take a firmer stand in Europe and do what's right. The next day's letter said, I'm voting for Hughes because if we elect him, he'll keep us out of the war. And Hughes himself was careful never to say anything that they could pin him down on. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hold this one for just a second? So uh, what you see here is a, a poster for uh, Woodrow Wilson. This is showing Charles Evans Hughes, uh, sorry, the Kaiser, putting up Hughes for president posters. So in other words, each side kind of demonized the other side's foreign policy, but neither side really had any alternative uh, to speak of. Next slide, please. Election of 1916, as I know some of you guys know, uh, was the closest election in American history up to that point. Something like 2,500 votes in California, had they gone the other way, would have put Charles Evans Hughes in the White House. And one time doing research in Paris, I actually came across some documents in the French government uh, right around the election, which initially reported to the French cabinet that Wilson had lost and Charles Evans Hughes had won. Right? That's how close it was. Okay? And we can talk about all of the impacts that that has. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, there's a global setting to all of this. Germany's not the only problem that the Americans are thinking about. There is the Pancho Villa crisis in Mexico, um, and there is the growth of Japan in the Pacific, both of which are very worrying to American strategic thinkers, political leaders, and people more generally. Uh, the founder of the Chicago Tribune, maybe not the founder, but Joseph Metal Patterson, was he the founder, Paul? Who's... Okay, who's... who's Medill, sorry. Who's... Did I get that wrong or did I get that right? Okay. Okay, so it's fair enough to say that, that, that us being here is at least indirectly tied to, to this family, right? Maybe directly tied. Um, he was far more concerned about Japan than he was about Germany. He thought the growth of Japan was America's largest strategic problem. The point is, as we approach 1916 and into 1917, all of these things start to come together. So the Pancho Villa raid, if you take a very careful look at what Americans were saying about it, they're basically saying, look, these Mexicans aren't good enough to have done this on their own. Germany had to be behind them. Most American cabinet officials think that that's the case. Maud, uh, I can't remember her last name, Maud, I keep wanting to say Maud Adams, but that was a James Bond actress. Um, Maud somebody whose name is escaping me now, it's been a long week, um, whom Pancho Villa had captured and then let go gave interviews in the American media saying that Pancho Villa bragged about the money he had gotten both from the German and the Japanese governments to invade New Mexico. Right? There are also stories in the newspaper about Japan trying to take advantage of American distraction by building naval bases in Baja, California. Right? A Chicago Tribune reporter, Floyd Gibbons, who later went on to win a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Gibbons chartered a fishing boat and went down to Baja, California in 1916 and said, I didn't see any Japanese personnel there, but they're building one. They're trying to put a naval base in Mexico. Right? The point I want to raise, two points really, is that the global concerns the Americans are facing come together. And the second point in all of this is that the American people are coming to the conclusion that neutrality is making them less safe, not more. Neutrality is putting them in a worse position. And again, this is the context, I think, in which you can talk to your students about the Zimmerman telegram, which is about not just what Germany is up to, but it's about this international global fear that Americans are seeing between Germany, Mexico, and Japan. Right? This is a, as you all know, this is a telegram from the German government to the Mexican government inviting the Mexicans to invade the southwest of the United States and to talk to Japan about joining the alliance as well. Right? And these fears are out there. 
They're out there before the Zimmerman telegram, as I hope to show you in just a second, but the Zimmerman telegram brings them to the fore. Let me show you right now. Can I have the next slide, please? February 10th, 1916. This is the cover image of Life magazine with the title, My Country, Tis of Thee. Let me break this down for you. I showed this map in Canada a couple months ago. had a lot of fun with it, where Canada is labeled as barbarians, right? <laughs> This is the first year in 40-some years Canada has no team in the NHL playoffs, so maybe they're worried about barbarians too. But anyway, um, Blackhawks are in, Penguins are in, Flyers maybe not, so that's all good for everybody. Um, America is depicted here as New Prussia, right? Obvi the obvious concern and obvious fear here. Uh, Pittsburgh is Kruppborg. Uh, what is that? Schlotterhausen is Chicago, right? Uh, D.C. becomes New Berlin. Uh, a couple things on here that I really like to point out. Uh, the Southwest becomes known as the American Reservation. If you have anybody here that's a psychology major, you can talk about which Freudian principle that is, uh, with the capital as Goose Step, right there. Two American cities are named, uh, 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 renamed to Von Papen. This one right here, this is a reference, and Boyed City. This is a reference to an event in 1916 when the United States government discovered that Carl Boyed, the German naval attache, and Franz von Papen, the German commercial attache, were both running spy rings out of New York City, both running espionage and um, sabotage units out of New York City. I happened to have the address where that was, so a couple years ago I went down to see what building was there on that same site. It is the Deutsche Bank World Headquarters for North America. You can't make this stuff up. Uh, in late 1916, <laughs> President Wilson declared them both persona non grata and ordered them uh, taken out of the United States, ordered them removed from the United States. Uh, you can see that uh, the West Coast becomes Japonica, Baja California becomes Austriana. This becomes the province of Mexico with Wilhelmsburg as its capital. Okay, the point I want to make here is the increasing insecurity that Americans felt. It's not just Life magazine. In 1916, the United States bought the U.S. Virgin Islands. They were then the Danish Virgin Islands. We bought them, and the reason we did that was the fear that Germany would invade Denmark or, or you know, threaten Denmark with an invasion, take those islands as their price, and then use it to build a German base inside the Caribbean. You have American newspaper people, American people on the street, American politicians, certainly American diplomats, talking about a future in which Germany put so much pressure on Britain and France that Britain and France will sign a peace agreement that will turn over British and French islands in the Caribbean to the Germans. The reference to the Canadians as barbarians, I think, is not calling the Canadians barbarians. Remember what I said. Canada is part of Great Britain. It is entirely possible, and the American army is thinking about it, that if Germany defeats Great Britain on the Western Front, the price of peace could well be parts of Canada. And as you all know, the great powers have done this for centuries to Canada, trading bits and pieces of Canada back and forth. Quebec goes from France to Britain, Louisbourg goes back from Britain to France, back and forth, back and forth. There's no reason why a peace treaty that ended World War I could not produce something that looked roughly like this. Right? This is the situation that Americans find themselves in. And again, look at the date. It's February 1916. And as this situation continues through 1916, I argue, not only do the American people in general feel this insecurity, but the various immigrant groups inside the United States are feeling it as well. In other words, my point is, by the spring of 1917, when America finally does enter World War I, there is no discernible difference between what they would have called native-born opinion and the opinions of groups like the Italians, Jews, Germans, even the Irish which I can talk about in the Q&A if you want, because it's an interesting story too, though it's a, it's, a long, it's a long story, but it's a very interesting one. Could I have the next slide, please? The other thing that I like about this, um, this period in history, because the American government didn't do anything, even though everybody agrees the government should be doing something, the US government doesn't do anything. It turns down the Continental Army Plan, it passes instead the National Defense Act, which most people, especially conservatives in the United States, thought made the problem worse, not better. The response was what is known as the privatization of preparedness. The American people themselves stood up and said, if the U.S. government won't do anything, we'll do it. Thomas Edison formed a scientific advisory board for the United States Navy. He started training naval officers in the latest scientific advancement. 
This man, William Henry Welsh, the first dean of Johns Hopkins Medical School, in 1916 joined the United States Army Reserve as a doctor and began to create networks of doctors around the United States. Columbia University, those of you who teach in university faculties, imagine this. 1916, before US entry, the president of Columbia University, a noted pacifist, by the way, had a faculty meeting and said the United States Army has a G system, G12, Doug would know how many it went to in 1916, G1 to 6, 7, whatever it was in 1916. Every member of the faculty, you're going to figure out which one of those things your talents contributes to. And if the country goes to war, you're going to be asked to contribute to those. Figure it out. Put your name on this list. Everybody did it. Everybody did it. Right? The privatization of preparedness. Charles Mayo of the great Mayo Clinic joined Welsh's network. Right? The argument being, this war is coming, we have to get ready for it. We have to get ready for it. And if the government won't do it, we'll do it. People like Theodore Roosevelt are behind this movement. Right? This is the Plattsburgh movement. Right? If the government won't train soldiers, we'll go up in the wilds of upstate New York and we'll do it ourselves. Right? That's a stunt basically to embarrass Wilson into doing something, but it works nonetheless. It works nonetheless. All right, let me um, wrap up and then make sure we take time for questions. Can I have the last slide, please? This is President Wilson giving his declaration of war speech uh, 99 years ago this week, 99 years ago, I guess yesterday or two days ago. Um, the point that I want to make, uh, I don't know how you all do this in your, in your high schools or the textbooks that you use, but the discussion of how America got into the First World War is almost entirely absent from anything that I was ever taught and from most things that I did teach. I usually had to begin with this speech. Right? This isn't really about Woodrow Wilson. In my own personal view, Wilson is far behind what the American people in his own cabinet are trying to get him to do. Wilson is trying to hold on to a very difficult neutrality for far too long. New York City went on a war footing in mid-March. New York City declared itself on a war footing in mid-March. Right? That's after the German resumption of submarine warfare, after the release of the Zimmerman telegram, the American people are moving ahead of Woodrow Wilson. Second, just like today, the structure of the American government played an important role. Our own federalized system, the way we think about military affairs, the way we like to decentralize things, contributed to the problems that the United States would face during the war itself. And third, and this is what I mean by the bottom up rather than the top down, and I just want to uh, hint on one of these here, hit one of these things here. In my view, the American people went to war. Sorry, I forgot I had the clicker. Whoever's back there, sorry. The American people went to war in order to stop this. On November 11th, 1918, when Germany agreed to an armistice, they no longer had to fear this. In my view, the American people did not want then to follow Woodrow Wilson into the creation of a new world order. What they wanted was for this to stop. And it did on November 11th, 1918, which is why when we commemorate the end of the First World War, now when we commemorate Veterans Day more generally, we do it on November 11th. We don't do it on June 28th, which commemorates the 1990, 1919 signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Right? This is what the American people thought the United States was doing and what it should be doing. Wilson's performance at the Treaty of Versailles, something altogether different, something that the vast majority of the American people either didn't want or had severe doubts about. So when we think about the First World War, I think we need to be thinking about not just the impacts it had for progressivism, for domestic patterns, for all the things that I know you do in your classes, but to think about what it means for the United States going forward, and in my own personal view, to understand the First World War less as a parenthesis in our history than as an important part of the time stream thereof. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. I guess you could say Wilson was leading from behind. Yes, I would say that. I would uh, say that. Okay, we'll take questions. The way we do this is we ask you to uh, make vertical your 10 cards, and then we'll call upon you. When you speak, be sure to press on the tab in front of your microphone so that everybody can hear and that it goes into our tape. And we ask you to state your uh, name, school, city, and state. So we'll begin uh, with this question over here. Mark Yonaway, Wamogo High School, Litchfield, Connecticut. Question is, 
was Wilson's racism part of his objection to the Continental Army plan? Yes, simple answer, yes. Uh, and it wasn't just Wilson's. Um, it was the, you know, a, a large part of the American structure, both North and South, I, I, I should point out. Yes, the simple answer is yes. Back. Uh, Chris Hughes, uh, Stanwich School of French and Benefit. you elaborate on Irish American sentiment and yeah. the war? So it's complicated, uh, Irish American sentiment. Um, there are certainly a large number of Irish Americans uh, who are suspicious of the British. And what they're saying is, over time, if we get in the war, it should be for American reasons, not British reasons. Um, the weird thing that happens is that by the time you approach about late 1916, 1917, um, I'm going to leave aside the Easter Rising, though we can talk about it after this if you like. What most Irish Americans are saying by late 1916, early 1917, is that because of the Easter Rising, Germany is not an alternative model for Ireland. Germany can offer nothing positive for Ireland. What they conclude is, and it's a widely shared view, um, the best hope for Ireland is if the United States has a dominant voice in winning the war and then forces Britain to accept the principle of national self-determination. That would give Ireland a voice at the post-war peace. What they don't know is that Wilson has already determined that Ireland isn't worthy of its own nation, that he's going to back the British view when he gets to Versailles. Um, a decision that Wilson's already made that the Irish American community doesn't know. But the conclusion leading into 1917 is you can have three possible outcomes here. Germany can win the war, bad for Ireland. Britain can win the war without an American voice, bad for Ireland. Or Britain can win the war with America as a senior member of the coalition. That's the best of the three options for Ireland. Does that make sense? And I can talk more about the Easter Rising and all the weird things that came out of that if you like. Um, based on your thesis, um, was there actually no need for the government fears regarding the draft in June of 1972? They had all those um, performative speeches trying yeah. to amend draft rights. <laughs> so I, I can't prove it, but my suspicion is that you're absolutely right. Um, in other words, there's a lot of nativist fear that's going on. There are a lot of nativists who are saying, look, we can't trust these immigrants. They're bad. They're going to do bad things. Um, when the war broke out, Newton Baker, who later became Secretary of War, was mayor of Cleveland, and he called the police chief in, and he said, look, we better hire a few more cops, let's get some more guns, some more billy clubs. And the police chief says, look, Mr. Mayor, I'll do what you want, but these people aren't going to cause you any trouble at all. Right? Um, there is a, a strand of nativist opinion that just can't, simply cannot get rid of that fear. And in my view, it was a completely unnecessary and unjustified fear, amplified by the fact that there's a 1916 presidential election in which both parties are going for the core of that nativist vote. But in my view, the fear is ridiculously exaggerated. It's a great question. We got someone down on the left here. Paul Dickler, FPRI. I was wondering if you could make, like in bullet point style, a few comments about your overall feeling of Wilson's presidency in terms of his foreign policy. Yeah, I have to say, the more I was working on this project, the, the, the more I came really to dislike almost everything about Woodrow Wilson. Um, <laughs> uh, just cards on the table. It, it just seems, though, that you dislike him in a different way than most people who dislike him. Uh, I'm not sure about that, because I, I, I don't know. Um, it, it seems to me he had a very difficult time really understanding what was happening in Europe. Um, he had a really hard time grasping what it meant for the United States. Um, and he did a really poor job of listening to people who knew much more than he did. Um, I was just talking with Nate in the back. I mean, at the Versailles Peace Conference, he met with Tasker Bliss, I think, three times. And Tasker Bliss is probably the most insightful American in Paris on what's happening in the world. And Wilson just didn't want to talk to him. I know more than he does. Um, that, you know, there's a, arrogance is a terrible, terrible trait, and he had it in abundance. How's that for bullet points? So, so in other words, not just the Treaty of Versailles, but and the League of Nations, everything before it as well. You see in the same light. Yeah. So there's there's two there's two little anecdotes I love from the Paris Peace Conference. One is when or World War One when Georges Clemenceau saw the 14 points, his reaction was God Himself was content to give us 10, which is a great line. <laughs> and when um, and when David Lloyd George was criticized for not doing better for Britain in the Paris Peace Conference, he said, what did you want me to do? I was sitting between Napoleon and Jesus Christ himself. <laughs> so his contemporaries picked up on this as well. Can I take the question? Are you, are you hook, giving me the hook here? Or are you? Yeah, okay. Go ahead, Amit. Uh, 
Paul Prep from the PA School of Engineering. Uh, you mentioned, this is a clarifying question, you mentioned that when the American journalists get to the map, they say to question the British property. And I was just wondering if you could clarify that because the burning of the land was sort of well established across the time. Yeah, so it's not just Levin, it's, it's the entire Belgian atrocity uh, thing. So, in other words, what the American reporters are saying is, uh, be careful, um, there's a lot of stuff going on. Walter Hines Page says it too. There's a lot of atrocities being reported in the British media that we can't, we can't substantiate. We don't know if they actually happen. What we can do, however, is give you a chapter and verse on the things we saw ourselves. So what they're saying to the American people is, don't believe what you're reading in the British media. Believe what we can tell you, what we know for sure happened. Um, what they're really trying to do is prevent, this is 1914, a lot of people are making that argument that the United States should not become an extension of the British or French army. We should act in the way we have to act. So there's a lot of suspicion about what the British media is up to, what the British are trying to do. Um, it's especially prominent, as you might guess, among Irish Americans and German Americans. So a lot of the American reporters who are there, they're probably also trying to sell their own newspapers, right? Read from us, don't read from the London Times. Um, but they're, they're really critical of what the British media is doing. Um, so again, I mean, I think the propaganda thing only goes so far. I mean, and I also think just as a general thing, people believe the propaganda they want to believe, and they disbelieve the propaganda they don't want to believe. That's what a presidential election cycle proves. Um, but the same thing's happening in 1914. Thank you. My name is Javier Irigueta, and I was um, looking at our notes, my notes from a previous FPRI uh, conference here where uh, Nicholas Lambert spoke. And he made uh, a great, uh, he put a great deal of weight on the cotton industry. Yeah. And he said that that was the main source of export earnings, highly vulnerable. Basically, all the brokers had been driven to bankruptcy as a result of the cutting off of insurance and credit. And he thought that that was the main, actually, he thought that that was the main thing that drove Wilson eventually uh, into, into war. Uh, yeah, I don't think it drives him, uh, Wilson into war, but it does set up a, a, a series of friction points. So the cotton economy in the United States South just collapses, um, which has just enormous consequences, not just for the United States, but for Britain, for Turkey, for Egypt, where the British go to get their cotton after that. It's actually, uh, you could write an entire book on just that. Um, what it does do is it's the one commodity, cotton, that the British have put on the contraband list. That is, they're going to they're going to seize it on the high seas, because the Austro the Germans and the Austro Hungarians use you, you use cotton to pack artillery shells. It's the one commodity where the British Foreign Minister Edward Grey and the British Ambassador in the United States Cecil Spring Rice convinced the British government to lift the contraband on cotton, because it was upsetting the Americans so much. In other words, better to let the cotton go through to the Germans than to create this friction point with the United States. Um, it's an enormously important issue. It leads to the core constituency of this, of course, are southern cotton growers, which are Wilson's core constituency. So Wilson thinks that he has to show a greater degree of neutrality. Cotton is unbelievably important to this story. Uh, but by mid-1915, I think most of the major issues in it have been resolved. So I accept Nick's point up to about 1914 into 1916. Um, and his book, Planning Armageddon, is the book that really lays a lot of this economic warfare stuff out. Um, but I don't think it's a main reason why the U.S. gets involved. Uh, George Haldeman from uh, Muscoota High School in Illinois. Uh, since you brought it up earlier, you said the uh, Lusitania you thought was a big turning point. You said you would address that, so I was just going to see if you could go ahead and just address how you thought it was such a big turning point. Yeah, thanks. So I, I mean, I, I, here's what I think is important about the Lusitania sinking. Um, it does not lead the United States into war. Very few Americans call for war. Almost nobody calls for war. What it does do, however, is force Americans to realize that this war will now affect them and they need to start making hard choices. So what do you want to do about it? And again, Doug, Doug and I teach at the same institution. I, the, I see what's going on here actually quite similar to what we see with what's going on with ISIS a century later. There's something very bad happening out there. What do you actually want to do about it? And until the Lusitania, I don't think the United States really had to address that question. After the Lusitania, you do. Do you want to build an army? If so, what do you want it to look like? Do you want to put that money into ships? If so, what kind of ships do you want to build? Do you want to form alliances? If so, which alliances do you want? Right? Those questions now have to be answered. Um, the other thing that it does is it, it really takes those people who were either pro-German or 
complete pacifists, it destroys the, it takes the, the, the ground out from underneath them. The argument really becomes how do we deal with Germany rather than what do we do about the war? That's about as quick as I can answer that question. I hope that does it a little bit. Anybody else? Yeah? Uh, Jim Feldman, uh, Uh, what caused the Japanese to change their policies in order to enable this? So, Japan. Japan's really complicated, too, uh, because pre-war, Japan has a naval alliance with Great Britain. So the deal that the British cut with the Japanese is essentially any German territory or possession you can get north of the equator will recognize that as a Japanese acquisition after the war, will recognize that you can keep it, which actually runs counter to what the Australian and New Zealand governments want. It's a curious little infight that they get. Um, the United States doesn't want Japan to have those territories either. So it's a friction point with Great Britain. The building of the island fortifications, I'm pretty sure, Doug can correct me if you know and I'm, and, and I'm wrong, happens because the Washington Naval Conference after the war, 1920s, limits what Japan can build in terms of ships. It doesn't limit how much money they can spend on fortifications. I think that's a post-war phenomenon. But Doug's shaking his head yes, so I'm going to guess that I have that right. Lenore Hino, um, Centennial High School, Circle Pines, Minnesota. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent, and of course hindsight is 2020, but to what extent were Germany and Japan perhaps capable of coming into the Western Hemisphere at this point in time? Yeah, so I don't know that they're too capable of doing it, but they're capable of creating an awful lot of damage. So um, there is an entire German sabotage network that's going on inside the United States that Wilson did not want to recognize. He wanted to treat them as what we would today call lone wolf attacks. In other words, that they're not connected back to the government. In the summer of 1916, there is an enormous one um, in Jersey City, New Jersey. What is today Liberty State Park in New Jersey was a railroad depot that German agents blew up. I mean, the most violent act of terrorism in American history before 9-11. Um, the reason the Statue of Liberty's right arm was closed until a couple of years ago is because of this attack. That's how big it was. Um, so the American government, the American people know these sabotage events are going on. That's the real concern. It's more that than it is um, being able to project force. But if you get Canadian bases, if you get naval bases in the Caribbean, if, you, if Mexico lets you deploy, pre-deploy forces, that's a bad scenario. So th that's something that this is something that no American military leader wants. Even, you know, ignore the new Prussia and the Japonica and whatever. But German, German assets in Canada, in the Caribbean, and in Mexico is not something you want to see. And the analogy that a lot of Americans draw is to China, a big, powerful, strong country that's being carved up by its neighbors because it can't defend itself, and it can't defend its own strategic perimeter. That's the concern more than the Germans showing up in Newark, right? It's just in Newark, it couldn't be that bad, but the Germans would do it, yeah. As quickly as they could, they said, we have no interest, no, I mean, remember, there's a Mexican Civil War, this is a really complex history, too, uh, but the official stand of the Mexican and Japanese governments are that they want nothing to do with the Zimmerman telegram. We renounce all potential of alliance, which was probably the smart thing to do. It's definitely the smart thing to do. Anyone else? There's a question in the back. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm from Carthage College in Wisconsin. Thank you for a very informative presentation. Could you expand on um, intelligence related to uh, information gathering rather than sabotage. My vague impression yeah. is that the British effectively ran rings around the Germans in terms of understanding and also manipulating American public and leadership opinion. Yeah, the, the British were actually really good at it. Um, the Germans were trying. It's actually interesting. I don't know a whole lot about this, but um, the Germans actually closed down a lot of their information and propaganda offices in the United States after the Lusitania because they're, they're just not worth the return. So the, I even found one uh, report where a German um, attache in the United States says, look, I'm trying to buy American newspapers. I can't even bribe newspaper editors. If I can't bribe newspaper editors, we've lost the propaganda battle, right? I used to, you know, I can't, I can't bribe, it used to be the easiest thing in the world, now I can't do it. 
So um, there is a certain sense in which the Germans cede that ground to the British, that we're, we're just not in, we just can't do it. H.L. Mencken talks about uh, Germans coming up and trying to buy his newspaper, and Mencken telling them, even though I'm German, I won't do it. Um, so I think it's partly that the British got better at it and the Germans gave up. The Germans just stopped doing it. The main Austro-Hungarian propaganda guy in the US, the Austro-Hungarians sent him back to Austria because it's just not doing any good. Nobody wants to buy what they're selling. So I think it's as much that the central powers give up on the campaign. So it's, it's Armenia and it's the Lusitania are the two things that, that, that do that. All right, again, I apologize. Oh, sorry, is there one more? Sure. And I don't like microphones. Okay. Um, you know, when I'm teaching, I like to have the students think about the decisions that they had to make. Or we find ourselves in similar situations. So what would you say is the biggest lesson that we should learn as we're applying, you know, again, like even looking at the privacy, privatization of preparedness? In a way, you can even think about people taking things into their own hands in the south along the borders and things like that. So what are some lessons that we should be thinking about as we move forward. So it's possible that it's just that I've been doing this research and it's making me look for parallels where they, making me see stronger parallels than exist. But to me, they're everywhere, right? I mean, it's, it's the same dilemma happening here as is happening with America looking at the Middle East or looking at Ukraine or looking at, you know, you see something that's very, very bad out there. Um, what do you want to do to help? This, is, this is really happens with Armenia. When the reports on Armenia start coming in, in the United States, it's something really, really awful that's happening. We really wish it weren't happening. What can we do? What should we do? It's the same thing. And again, the sticking point of when you become a belligerent is not that something bad is happening to someone else. It's the threat of that bad happening to you. It's the same, it's the same kind of cycle uh, that I see. And also, incidentally, in the 1930s leading up to World War II as well. If there are, there are bad things happening somewhere, and the American people reach out. I mean, 1914, 15, 16, the American people are sending entire hospitals. They are raising money for entire hospitals to be built on the Western Front. Um, all of that effort is going to the Allies. None of it is going to Germany and Austria, which I think is symbolic in and of itself. Um, wealthy Americans are, are, I mean, it's incredible what's happening. I mean, it's not, and it's not just wealthy Americans. Um, but to reach the point of going to war requires a direct threat to you. Because this is a serious thing that you're, you know. Um, so I, I see an awful lot of parallels. I think you can also look at the kind of political dysfunction. You can look at the way that Congress wants to do it one way, the president wants to do it another, and you have that conflict. Uh, there's a presidential election which politicizes it and makes it even harder. So I'm not even sure that it's mistakes and do well. I think it's a recognition of the way your system is built, right? Our system is designed to decentralize power. It, that, that's what it's built for. Um, that's not good for military and that's not good for wars. That's why when wars begin, you see things like Alien and Sedition Act and Patriot Act. It's an attempt to, to fix that problem, um, whether, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. It's an attempt to address that fundamental problem within the system. Um, and the American people have a great tradition of privatized efforts. Um, you know, th those are things you should not be surprised to see. Personally, I think so. I mean, it's about recognizing both the strengths and the weaknesses of your system. So I, just a couple days ago, I was in New York City, and I took a group of, of war college students to uh, Citi. Citibank was founded to fund the War of 1812, which I didn't know. Right? And the point they were making is there are certain things governments don't do very well. Right? Funding wars is actually something they were arguing banks do very well. And that's what they were actually built to do. And so they, they're, they're the people who are responsible for getting cash to American soldiers overseas, getting money and, and, and resources overseas. So, you know, that's a strength of the American system and it's a weakness of the American system at the same time. So um, in terms of mistakes, I mean, a lot of that depends on the way you see America's relationship to its military. I mean, I, I, again, I'm saying this with Doug in the back who knows far more about this than I do, but until very recently, the National Guards were not well integrated into the American military system. And it was a real frustration to the Army. To the National Guard, on the other hand, it was an effective check against the power of the Army. You know, Doug banging down your door and, you know, taking my Bruce Springsteen records, you know. So it just depends on where you see that, that, that essential balance. Um, last thing I'll say on that, that I think you can tie into any period of American history. Right? The reason we have the system that we have is because of the way the Constitution is written. Right? President's commander-in-chief, Senate declares war, House raises funds. We did that on purpose. So, 
Sorry, that's not a great answer. You were looking for lessons of history. I keep telling everybody that there aren't any, but. I wonder if you could comment on his, oh, sorry. Well, that's fine. Uh, Pete Gillen, uh, taught in high school, taught in Massachusetts. I just wonder, I look at that map and I'm seeing, you know, New Prussia and Japan and I'm thinking about how those, uh, um, both countries had um, some uh, belligerent sort of language. And I'm wondering if um, the fear is, was no, the, the intellectual history, the Nietzsche and writings, and, the, and if that was those kinds of things were known to the uh, Americans, or if they're more worried internally. I'm, I grew up in a place where there's German, still, still um, German-speaking communities. So I wonder if people viewed the threat more from what they heard from other, those other nations, or if there was a part of that that was also a different patterns of assimilation between Germans and. I find almost no evidence of Americans being worried about what German Americans will do at home. Almost none. And there are plenty of reasons for that, right? German immigration to the U.S. Uh, is disproportionately Catholic, it's disproportionately non-Prussian, it's disproportionately, you know, all these things. Um, until the war begins, there's, there's absolutely no evidence. I can't find, I can hardly find anything. Right. Once the war begins, it's a different, it's a completely different environment. Although I still think we've exaggerated it, but that's another another story for another lecture. Um, the fear, the real fear that Americans will point to is the Prussian aristocracy. It's the Junkers, it's the militarists, it's the Kaiser, which is why I think, one of the reasons why, I think the Kaiser becomes the most vilified and caricatured person of this war. So what the American people are saying is, look, the Germans who came to the United States, like the chief of police in Cleveland, they're people who left Europe to get away from the Austro-Hungarian, the Russian, the German, to get out of those systems. They're good people. They came here to be democratic and free and get away from military service. You know, my ancestors, Jews escaping the czar, you know, people like that, right? Until the war begins, there's really no concern about it. There's, there's no worry about it at all. And then again, as I said to, in response to a question earlier, then once the war starts, I think those nativist fears that are under the surface just boil over. Um, again, it's another talk for another day. But until April 1917, I can find absolutely no evidence in fact, there's plenty of evidence going just the other way, where German Americans are saying, look, you know if a war comes between Germany and the United States, we'll be right there. Chicago's Cardinal, Cardinal Mundelein, um, who was here, Mundelein gave a couple of very famous speeches in which he said, look, this is a conflict between our mother, Germany, and our wife, America. And he actually says, if, if, what happens in your house when the wife and the mother conflict? You side with the wife. Right? And he says it over and over again. He says, look, my father fought in the Civil War, you know, my, my, my sons will fight, or I guess he's a Catholic priest, so I didn't have sons, but the young men of our congregation will, you know, they, they will fight for America because they're Americans. There's no contradiction between being German and America. And that's a dominant theme, on, in, like I said, until 1917. Even then, I think it's coming from the nativist side more than the other. Javier, last question. Thank you, Javier that from Wilmington Friends School. I wonder if you would comment on historian Adam Tuza's recent book uh, that dates the beginning of the American century to 1916 when Wilson broke off uh, the um, loans by J.P. Morgan that would have kept the Allies going, according to him. Now, he doesn't like Wilson either, evidently, but it's not to say for the same reasons that you do. He seems to see uh, Wilson as having a kind of a, a, a master plan behind the scenes he claims that Wilson aspired to global hegemony, not militarily, as did Wilhelmine Germany, but through the imposition of a capitalist new order. Uh, he, his formulary, according to Tutu's, included industrial preeminence, preferential finance, and an open-door policy for trade everywhere, and a backward-looking presumption of white supremacy. So the two things I might add to that. One, I don't think it's Wilson. I think Wilson is an expression of that. Uh, but, you know, when you decenter the narrative, that is, when you take Wilson away from the center and you put the politicians as just one of many factors, what you see is that Wilson's, this isn't Wilson's vision, this isn't Wilson's master plan, this is what, the same thing would have happened had Charles Evans Hughes won that election, right? Because it makes, because you can do this. So that would be, I, I think, the first thing that I would say. Um, and the second, I keep thinking of that, I can't remember the name of the social psychologist now, who made the argument that you actually motivate people more by making them fear for what they'll lose than attracting them by what they might gain. 
So the rhetoric from 1914 to 1917 is not, we can gain 4% GDP, we can gain 5% GDP. The rhetoric is, if we don't do something, we're going to find ourselves in this. That's the rhetoric. Now, behind the scenes, you have bankers and investment people and, you know, um, um, Alex is here from Iowa. There were, I, I read plenty of things in Des Moines from the agriculture community in Iowa arguing that, you know, we have an opportunity here to grow the economy and do all kinds of great things if we're smart and nimble. But the driving motivation is fear. It's this. So, uh, you know, I, I don't see a master plan at work. I see the United States, all levels, governmental, uh, educational, industrial, agricultural, seeing an opportunity and grabbing that opportunity with both hands. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for an illuminating look at the kind of internal dynamics that uh, uh, settled in the United States as it prepared for war. We'll take a break and we'll be back uh, in 15 minutes.